Hello and welcome to the Beatles Zone and to my first appearance on the channel. Now, every Beatles channel or review channel worth its salt will have ranking videos of the Beatles albums. So, today it's the UK studio albums, albeit with one addition that may be a bit controversial. Number 13. So, at number 13, it's Yellow Submarine. It's really only half a Beatle album, with the other half being the George Martin score, which I quite like, but for that reason alone, it can't really stand up to the other albums. Standout track and one of my favourites from the Beatle catalogue, though, is definitely Hey Bulldog. Really raw, rocking, great riff. I also love George's It's All Too Much, and I might be swimming against the tide with this opinion, but I quite like Only a Northern Song. One song that works better in the movie, rather than as a purely listening experience, though, is Altogether Now, which is one I've never taken to, but in the movie it's fine. Number 12. Okay, the next three are difficult, but here goes. Some of you love this record, myself included, but 1963's Please Please Me is at number 12. We all know the story and how fast it was recorded. It's rough in places, and of course that's part of its charm. Paul McCartney said about the song Please Please Me in the music press at the time, We also wrote Please Please Me, but that hasn't exhausted our supply of compositions. We've got nearly a hundred up our sleeves, and we're writing all the time. I suppose writing is the wrong word, really. John and I just hammer out a number on our instruments. If we want anyone to hear it, we record it, then send them a tape. We've had disappointments, but coming in at number 17 has please pleased us, he quipped. Now, standouts for me are the usual suspects. Please Please Me, as mentioned just now in the article, I saw her standing there, a great rocker then, and now again on the Red Album, reissue it. Sounds superb. I have a soft spot for There's a Place. And of course, the album closer, Twist and Shout, is as fine a vocal as Lennon ever laid down. Number 11 Now, the next two often change positions, but today at number 11 it's Beatles for Sale. The opening 1-2-3 punch of No Reply, I'm a Loser, and Babies in Black is among the finest starts to a Beatle album. Paul McCartney had this to say about these tracks. No Reply John sings this one, and I do the vocal harmony. We tried to give it different moods, starting off quietly with a sort of vaguely bossa nova tempo, building up to a straight beat crescendo in the middle, and then tailing off quietly again. I'm a loser. I reckon the best way to describe this one is a folk song gone pop. John and I both sing, but John does most of it. He also played some nice harmonicas too. Babies in Black i better explain what John and I meant by this title, hadn't I? The story is about a girl who's wearing black, because the bloke she loves has gone away forever. The fella singing the song fancies her too, but he's getting nowhere. We wrote it originally in a waltz style, but it finished as a mixture of waltz and beat. After that, it's a mixed bag of covers and originals. There is, of course, the cracking single Eight Days a Week, and I've always been partial to McCartney's I'll Follow the Sun and What You're Doing. And as much as I like I Don't Want to Spoil the Party, it doesn't quite come up to the same standard as the opening three-song salvo. The remaining covers, although enjoyable, have the Beatles sounding, at least to my ears, rather tired. Number 10. Number 10. It's With the Beatles. The music press of the day had some very interesting things to say. The Beatles do not play or sing brilliantly, but they put over their numbers with a brash enthusiasm and a resounding beat, and their gift for melody and harmony is well in evidence on their own numbers. So, apparently they didn't sing or play brilliantly. That article was by someone calling themselves Mr. Popbeat. I wonder if he still thinks the same. Anyway, again we have three great opening tracks. It won't be long. All I've got to do and all my loving. 
Don't bother me and little child follow, and while these tracks seem to have their detractors, well, I quite enjoy them myself. Of the other originals, Hold Me Tight seems to draw criticism, but I think it's a fine little song. And Not A Second Time has always been one of my favourites from this particular album. And add to that, controversial as it may be, my favourite Ringo vocal is I Wanna Be Your Man. And the album becomes a great listening experience for me. The covers are also a notch above those on the later Beatles for Sale. Please Mr Postman is excellent, and I've always loved the band's delivery of money. And unlike when I skip covers like Honey Don't on Beatles for Sale, there are certainly no skippers here. Number nine. Okay, we get away from the early era for the first time here, with my number nine. Let it be. Despite the obvious problems with the production by a certain Phil Spector, I do find a great deal to enthuse over here. A certain Alan Klein had this to say regarding sales at the time. According to Klein, Let It Be is already the fourth best-selling Beatle album. The list is headed by Abbey Road, about five million, said Klein, followed by their first ever US album, Meets the Beatles, 4.3 million, and Hey Jude, 3.3 million. In fifth place behind Let It Be is Sgt. Pepper, usually regarded as the biggest Beatle seller, 2.7 million. So, despite the film sounding like a downer at the time, LP sales were extremely positive. Let It Be The Song remains a moment of hymn-like brilliance, no matter how many times I've heard it, and I've liked Get Back since I was a child. I've always loved The Long and Winding Road, and yes, that's despite John Lennon's musical brain being on vacation during the bass parts. The orchestral version is fine to me, but I do have a soft spot for the naked version too. There's also one of my favourite Lennon tracks, Across the Universe. It has, for me, a kind of ethereal quality. And goodness knows why Lennon disliked his voice. Great performance here. I Me Mine from George gets a lot of stick, but it's a fine song. So too is For You Blue, with Lennon on Great Hawaiian Slide. Hearing the band doing the early track, One After 909, is a blast. I've got a feeling, great vocals. I do have to admit that the whole album is a better listening experience for me these days after viewing Peter Jackson's Get Back. Number eight. Now at number eight, the soundtrack to the Beatles' second movie, Help. Now, when I look at the track listing and I realise it's only my number eight, it speaks volumes for the quality above it. And if I'm honest, my rankings of help and the remaining albums can fluctuate a little over time. But today, it's number eight. Chris Welch said this in The Melody Maker at the time. It's good, and help, the title of the Beatles' new LP, will be the cry of all British groups who will try to equal the standard of this brilliant new album. Inconceivably, they have written a whole new crop of unique, memorable songs, performed with the Beatles' painless soul. They don't sound as if it hurts to sing with feeling. There's something of the medieval minstrels in the Beatles. One imagines them performing beneath some bird's window. They communicate. Medieval minstrels. Not sure about that. Anyway, yesterday, Ticket to Ride, the title track Help, You're Gonna Lose That Girl, You've Got to Hide Your Love Away, Fabulous stuff. My least favourite here is probably Act Naturally. A skipper for me sometimes. And you know what? I've always enjoyed the cover of Dizzy Miss Lizzie. Lennon is in fine shredding voice here. It has its detractors, but it beats all the covers on Beatles for Sale, for example. And I'm going against the grain again when I say I like its only love. Yes, I know Lennon belittled it, but I think he was wrong. It's a fine little song. Number seven. It's Rubber Soul. This was the logical follow-on to help, in my opinion. So, what's the summing up? First, one marvels and wonders at the constant stream of melodic ingenuity stemming from the boys, both as performers and composers. Keeping up their pace of creativeness is quite fantastic. 
Not perhaps their best LP in terms of variety, though instrumentally, it's a gas. There's even a leftover help track making an appearance here, the enjoyable weight. It's a track I've always liked. But there are serious heavyweights on this album. Drive My Car, Norwegian Wood, Nowhere Man, In My Life, Michelle, Girl. There are two of my favourite Harrison tracks, If I Needed Someone, and Think For Yourself. I might sometimes skip what goes on. Sorry, Ringo. Again. But overall, it's a killer album. Run For Your Life is disliked by some, but I've always enjoyed it. And what about the great cover? The photo slipped when they were initially viewing it, distorting it and becoming one of the most famous and iconic LP covers. Number six. Well, here's where the diehards start screaming at the screen, because at number six I have 1967 Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Yes, it's a fine album, and it perfectly encapsulates the time. It did in fact dominate that year's Grammy Awards. The album was nominated as a particularly great album of the year. In addition, it received awards as the best technically engineered album of the year and the best contemporary album of the year. The LP cover also earned the Academy's best album cover of the year. So, highly respected then as now. But there are, in my opinion, better overall albums by the Beatles. It's only by virtue of the fact that I've been listening to Lucy in the Sky and A Day in the Life a lot lately that it's changed positions with Rubber Soul. So, along with those two tracks, and of course the title track and reprise, there are other standouts. I've always liked Getting Better, Fixing a Hole, and George's Within You, Without You. But I'll often skip Benefit of Mr. Kite, When I'm 64, and She's Leaving Home. Not that they're bad songs, but they're just not top-tier Beatles songs for me, and I've always loved the iconic cover of. Number five. At number five is the best of the early Beatles, A Hard Day's Night from 1964. It was the first album to feature all original material. Lennon was the main writer and vocal lead on nine of the 13 tracks, all first rate. Here's a quote from John and Paul in the June 64 issue of Beatle Monthly. Says John, there were times when we honestly thought we'd never get the time to write all the material, but we managed to get a couple finished while we were in Paris during our stay at the Olympia, and three more were completed in America while we were soaking up the sun on Miami Beach. In came Paul to say, the only real panic was over the title number. For a long time, there wasn't a title at all, so that had to be a bit of a rush job. Now, this is an album full of some of my favourites, from the title track Hard Day's Night to Any Time At All, If I Fell and You Can't Do That. Add to these a brace of McCartney classics, Can't Buy Me Love, and I Love Her, and Things We Said Today. It's an album I never get tired of. Number four. Here's where people will be booing at the screen and making out like I'm some kind of pantomime villain. Remember at the top of the program, I said there was one choice that may be controversial. Yes, at number four, it's Magical Mystery Tour. And yes, I do see this as canon, despite it being a US creation. It's one of the few times Capital actually got things right, at least in my opinion. I was gifted this in the 70s as an import, so it was the way I first heard it. A fully-fledged, bona fide Beatle album with some great singles. Hello, Goodbye, I Am The Walrus, First Impressions. Typical McCartney vocals on this deliberately repetitive medium pace item. It sounds like a send-up. The lyrics, what are there, mean nothing, but the insidious, compelling brainstorming will take this to number one. Flip is far better from Magical Mystery Tour. John takes lead on this fantastic wailing production, interesting acidy sounds throughout and catchy strange lyrics, a very long side with the usual Beatles psychological tricks being played throughout. Save as milk, top 50 tip. We also have Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane, one of the greatest double A side singles ever. 
Not much else to be said there until I have my Beatles song rankings. And what of the rest? The title track is one I have adored since childhood. Fool on the Hill? Great ballad. All You Need Is Love, the aforementioned I Am The Walrus, and Hello Goodbye. Classics, one and all. There's the weird and wonderful droning Blue Jay Way. I even love the atmospheric flying. Your mother should know. Baby, I'm a rich man. There isn't a single skipper on here for me. So there you have it. Magical Mystery Tour. Number three. Now we get into difficult territory. Three albums for me separated by a gnat's hair. At number three, 1969's Abbey Road. Now, don't be too hard on me here. This is an album that I often place at the top, but I go in phases. As of now, it's number three, but what an album. Although critics haven't always seen it that way. As it stands, Abbey Road isn't tremendous. Still, it has 15 fine minutes, and by rock standards, that's a lot. Needless to say, I disagree. The opener, Come Together with its swampy bass, is excellent, and coupled with Harrison's superb something, was a number one in the States and Australia, and a number four in England. Other highlights are McCartney's vocals on Oh Darling, the epic I Want You, She's So Heavy, and the whole of Side 2. The first side does have a couple of lesser tracks. I've always found Octopus's Garden pleasant, and I don't skip it. I don't dislike it, but it's not one of my top-tier favourites. The same goes for Maxwell's Silver Hammer. It's a nice, jaunty tune, but it's second division when compared to You Never Give Me Your Money, or Oh Darling from McCartney on this very album. Number two. Okay, some of you will have guessed by now. Yes, at number two, it's the 1968 White Album. I'll call it a sprawling, flawed masterpiece. Some of my favourite Beatles songs are here. Helter Skelter, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, Dear Prudence, Happiness is a Warm Gun, Birthday, Everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey, back in the USSR and more besides. But yes, there's a big fat elephant in the room. I know some people love it, but I am of course talking about Revolution 9. The Bad and the Ugly is crystallised in Revolution Number 9, a pretentious piece of old codswallop, which is no more than a long, long collection of noises and sound seemingly dedicated towards the expanding sale of Aspro. I am angry at this because the listen to me, I'm being mysterious bit is a piece of idiot immaturity and a blotch on their own unquestioned talent as well as the album. Ah, revolution number nine. While it is interesting as a piece of music concrete, it doesn't hold my attention these days. In fact, it doesn't appear on my White Album playlist at all. Despite this, the sheer amount of favourites I have on this album plants it firmly now at number two. The same NME article ends by saying this. To sum up, two generally superb albums, although with a few tracks which fall below standard, and a couple of items which do no more than fill time, but this is simply being hypercritical to hypertalent. On balance, the Beatles offer so many brilliant McCartney-Lennon future standards and so much inventiveness from all of them that it has to be well worth waiting for. I advise you to rush out and order it as fast as your little legs will carry you. So there you have it, the classic White Album. Number one. So, this will now come as no surprise. At number one, it's Revolver from 1966. This is probably the Beatle album I've listened to the most in my life. It has a great array of styles, and one I never get bored with. Yellow Submarine probably has the most detractors, but it's a fun little children's song, and I love the animated film, so its inclusion works for me. Elsewhere, we have the innovative use of tape loops on Tomorrow Never Knows, one of my favourite Harrison songs, Taxman, the haunting Eleanor Rigby, here, there, and everywhere, one of McCartney's most beautiful songs, and the list goes on. Melody Maker in 1966 
said this. For the Beatles' approach to songwriting is faintly haphazard, which could perhaps be one of the secrets of its spontaneous success. The melody maker asked the Beatles recently just how they approached the problem of producing 14 new songs for a new album. The Beatles approached the problem of their new album titled Revolver by writing and recording the songs over a period of about 11 or 12 weeks. John and Paul kicked ideas, musical bits and pieces and words around until they had a basis for a song and then took it into the studio to work on it with George and Ringo. The 14 tracks on the new LP were created in this way and in fact the last track was written only a short time before it was recorded in the studios. It is without doubt the fertile creativity of John and Paul that is responsible for most of the mass of musical expression that's flowed from the Beatles. So I'll go through this album more comprehensively when I do the album review. Thanks for watching. Bye bye for now.